This is On Shifting Ground. I'm Ray Suarez. Ukraine has now withstood and repelled Russian forces for over a year, and the stories from the battlefield are remarkable. Joshua Yaffa has been covering them since the war began. In his reporting for The New Yorker magazine, Yaffa has focused on the dignity and courage of the Ukrainian people, but he notes in a recent article, there's nothing to romanticize one year into the Russian invasion. He's the author of Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition, and Compromise in Putin's Russia, and he joined me from the German capital, Berlin, a couple of days before the anniversary of the invasion. Joshua Yaffa, welcome to Unshifting Ground. Thanks for having me. You know, we get very different reports by the hour about what's going on in the battle space on Ukrainian territory in the eastern part of the country. How does one guy cover it? I'm not sure one guy does. Thankfully, there are dozens, uh, if not hundreds or more of my colleagues who are doing this work across Ukraine, led by remarkable Ukrainian colleagues whose work I've followed and admired for many years and have really come into their own with great bravery and professionalism since Russia's invasion began last year. What I've done is to try and find the kinds of stories that, well, frankly, interest me the most. I'm guided by my own curiosity, first and foremost, but also stories that I think are important, relevant, telling, illustrative of the larger story for readers, but also guided by my own tastes, my own sensibilities. I have less stomach for the real front than some other journalists. I don't particularly like, nor do I think I operate the best when under unceasing artillery shelling in a wet, damp, noisy trench, for example. I tend to find stories a bit off the front line about people whose lives have been affected or upended by the war, whether they've had their cities occupied, their homes destroyed, loved ones killed as civilians or in the military. But I like to find places that are close to where the war is really happening, but also with enough space where you can have a prolonged, deep, sustained conversation, which frankly isn't all that possible when both you and your interlocutor, first and foremost, need to worry about, frankly, staying alive. We're now a year in. This is very much a war, as you indicate, of blood and suffering on the ground, but it's also a war of dueling realities created by official announcements. Sometimes the same town can be the subject of an announcement from the Russian and Ukrainian militaries, and the story they tell about what's going on in that place is 180 degrees difference. How do you figure it out? Ideally, by going there or going close to there or talking to people from there, I wrote a story for The New Yorker earlier this year about a city called Izum, in the Kharkiv region, it was occupied at the beginning of the war by Russia, run under an occupation administration, and liberated by the Ukrainian military in September. And I went to Izum just in the wake of its liberation in late September and early October, and spent some time there specifically looking into the question of collaboration, a very fraught, murky, complicated question about who agrees to cooperate and to what extent and for what reasons during war? A painful question. And I had heard so many stories about Izum in particular, but also other cities that had been occupied, about the kinds of people who collaborated, how they explained or justified to themselves and others why they did, the kinds of justice or retribution that they might be facing after liberation. But of course, all of that was just uh, you know the, the most vague or surface understanding of the question compared to what happened when I actually went to Izum and, and walked the streets and went door to door and sat with people, spoke to them for hours, asked one group of people to recommend another, and in that sense really went house to house in some neighborhoods in Izum. And in the end, I felt like I was competent of writing at least a portrait of the city of Izum under occupation. But... That was the best I could do, and, and I hope, in fact, useful and interesting and, and sometimes right, telling the small story is actually the best way to get at the larger story, 
by finding something in miniature that you can tell with great detail and nuance and sensitivity. But I don't try and necessarily tell the whole story of the war all at once, all at one time. I think finding the smaller, acute, self-contained stories is actually both better in terms of what you can do narratively to hold the reader's attention, but I think also more true. It's interesting. Even that word collaborator is so freighted because in Eastern Ukraine, there are Russian speakers who longed for their status, their cousins in Russia proper. There were Russian speakers who still thought of themselves as Ukrainian. There were people who just caught in the crossfire. Collaborator, I mean, from the Latin, working with, well, all kinds of people are working with all kinds of other people. Settling that one must be tough. You're exactly right. And, and in the piece I wrote about people who are called in Russian and Ukrainian collaborante, uh, you know, a direct translation of that word, that, that word has really entered the Ukrainian lexicon this year. So it's a word I've also begun to use, although I'm aware it contains this kind of moral or even political judgment. But in this story, I wrote about these people who are to varying degrees by their neighbors and in some cases by Ukrainian law enforcement considered to be collaborators. I refrained from reaching any ultimate judgment myself. By the grace of God, go I. It was the attitude that I had when I was in Izum. Or rather, maybe to borrow another religious metaphor, I wasn't going to cast the first stone. Having not lived through the crucible of occupation and, and the trauma of occupation and faced these extraordinary dilemmas about not having enough to eat, not having enough medicines, thinking that your city had been taken over by force by the Russian military and it might stay that way for years, forever. You didn't know when liberation was going to come. Your kids had to go to school. Your elderly mother needed medical care. Those questions are so difficult that I felt like I wasn't in a position, and frankly, it would not only would not be correct, but maybe not interesting for me to show up and start casting judgment, but to rather listen to these stories, try and render them with as much nuance and truth as I could and, and present the complication in, in a way, utter unknowability of stories like those in Azum from under occupation. I think that the fact, as you pointed out, that it's so hard to make heads or tails of these stories and to understand where we draw the line in terms of responsibility and justice, that, that is the story, right? The murkiness and impossibility of knowing for sure is the story. I wonder if the modern era of social media adds just another level of complication to this. I'm constantly seeing videos of what are purported to be fleeing Russian troops, let's say, that are posted by Ukrainian sources. It's impossible, obviously, to know who shot the video, where, who those guys who I see their backs and <laughs> I see them with their rifles slung over their shoulders running away, who they are. You know, I'm, I'm sure being there doesn't make that any easier. No, I, I, I oftentimes my reporting trips in Ukraine are staring at the phone or staring at the computer screen just like I would in Berlin or elsewhere. It can be frustrating that at times because of how counterintuitive it is to end up in Ukraine to take the effort to get there. Not an easy journey these days, given how you have to go in by a combination of rail and car and so on. It takes about a day from anywhere. And, and then to do all of that and to still feel like you're following the war from your phone. But that perhaps is the inevitable task of a war correspondent in, in the 21st century. I tend to use those bits of video, other pieces of information posted on social media that then go viral, spread around, you know, a good piece of video from the front quickly goes viral, you won't miss it, as clues, as kind of breadcrumbs to figure out where the story might be headed, what's an interesting place to look, what's an interesting theme that might be emerging. But then you still have to use, let's say, old school reporting techniques to really build out your story, find people, go to the place, talk with them, see things with your own eyes. So I don't really use those videos as actual information or data points that I would build a story around or, or give to the reader as proof of whatever story it is I'm telling. I would more use them as hints and clues for myself about where do I want to look, 
what do I want to think and talk to people about? Where do I want to go? Getting me started for a reporting trip that will then turn into something for The New Yorker. A lot of war reporting sometimes feels like a third quarter score in an athletic contest. And you just ask, who's winning? But I'm not sure that's even a, a relevant question, is it? I mean, who's winning? It's a difficult question that doesn't just change by the day, but changes by where you're looking, who you're talking to, what part of society does the person you're talking to represent. Of course, the trajectory of the war matters. It certainly matters a lot for Ukraine, and frankly, it matters a lot for Russia too, right? The ultimate outcome of this war is going to be quite decisive for both of those countries and both of those societies. So it really does matter how the battlefield situation shakes out. What's the actual balance of forces and balance of power on the battlefield is going to be hugely decisive. It will, it will determine everything. It will determine what kind of political settlement ultimately emerges from this war, and it'll determine what happens to both Russia and Ukraine as, as countries and societies. That said, on the day today, I agree with you that just like politics has been sort of ruined or the coverage of politics has been ruined by turning it into a horse race about who's up, who's down, what do the polls say, who's winning as opposed to what's actually at stake. I think we can also make a similar, if you'll allow me the analogy mistake in covering war, at least covering this war, in that what is happening inside Ukraine and to the people of Ukraine, and that's the story I've reported most this past year, whether we're talking to psychologists who treat victims of sexual violence committed by Russian troops to the experience of those living under occupation and who either chose or felt compelled to collaborate, a story we talked about just a minute ago, visiting cities like Chernigov in northern Ukraine that were under siege for more than a month, relentlessly bombarded from outside. Those are important experiences to capture and to bring to readers, regardless of who is winning on the battlefield that day. The experience of this war now going on a year has been so profound and definitive and, and traumatic for Ukrainians that capturing that experience, I have to think, is crucially important to get that down on the page and try to somehow get that feeling across to readers is work that feels really important to me, regardless of who's captured what village and, and you know which direction the state of play on the battlefield looks to be headed on any given day. Well, let's proceed on the assumption that the vast media smorgasbord being what it is, this program is going out to lots of people who don't necessarily see your reporting in The New Yorker. So you've got fresh ears. What do you want Americans to know about what's going on in Ukraine? I've been struck by the duality of this war, which I don't think is particular to this war. I'm not a war correspondent per se. I'm someone who spent nearly all my professional life covering Russia, Ukraine, the region. So I came to the war accidentally, or the, or the war came to me. I don't know the best way to put it. But I don't have a lot of experience in war. I do have a lot of experience in both Russia and Ukraine, though. And what I can say is that the degree to which the war has been absolutely devastating, traumatic, painful, to really see the destructive power of war up close is, is something really horrifying to behold and to witness. And I think that has felt important in fine-grained detail to get on the page, to not shrink away from that, to write the story, like I mentioned, about the psychologists who work day and night to counsel those who were the subject of horrific sexual violence at the hands of Russian troops, to visit a village like Novoblikov outside of Kiev that was occupied in the early days of the war where I came across a cellar where a number of locals had been held by Russian forces when they occupied the town. And the night before Russian soldiers left, when they pulled out of the region, they went into that cellar and demanded four volunteers to be shot, saying they had a command for such an arbitrary number from their officers in the area. And, and, and just the horror of that story, the, the kind of miniature scale of it, right? Tens of thousands of people have died since Russia's invasion last year. But those four people who 
raised their hands and were taken into the night to be shot really just shook me to the core. And it, it felt important to get that recorded, to get that on the page and to bring that to readers. That's one side. The other side is the resilience, unity, bravery of Ukrainian people I've met across the country and over the year, the degree to which this war has really solidified a sense of Ukrainian nationhood that hadn't existed in such a form before. And, and that is the tragic and dark irony of this war, that Putin's invasion brought about the very thing that Putin thought he was fighting against from the beginning, right? A consolidated anti-Russian Ukraine built around a shared ideology, widely believed in, widely popular, of resisting Russia, being a kind of anti-Russia. That was the phantom that Putin thought he was fighting against when he made the decision to invade. What he's done is actually Frankenstein-like, bring his, his worst nightmare into reality. But to see that degree of consolidation, to see that degree of national unity up close has also been really, well, in this case, an invigorating and inspiring, I think it's fair to say, the degree to which the war has touched everyone and that everyone feels involved and implicated in the war effort, certainly those on the front, but even cities far away from it. It's been something to behold to see how Ukraine and Ukrainians have responded. In the 2014 to 22 period, there was a lot of material coming out of the eastern provinces that basically spoke to their Russianization. And because the story was being told in such a one-sided fashion, all you saw were signs in Ukrainian being taken down and replaced by signs in Russian, the ruble becoming a currency the closer you got to the border, really a story of this becoming, in all but name, a part of Russia. But since the Ukrainian army has retaken some of this territory, a very different story has come out about, you know, of... of soldiers being embraced, of people coming out of basements and saying that they've basically lived through a multi-year nightmare until the army, the national army of Ukraine, took these places again. Can, are those places being made Ukraine again? Well, to my knowledge, the Ukrainian army hasn't liberated areas that have been occupied since 2014 and, and onward. The only areas that the Ukrainian military has liberated are those areas that were occupied since the start of this most recent full-scale invasion. What will happen if and when Ukrainian army is able to reach those parts of Donbass in the eastern Ukraine that were occupied, as you said, not 12 months ago, but eight years ago, is, is a big question as to what the kinds of, what kinds of attitudes the Ukrainian military and Ukrainian government will find there. I can say that in a place like Izum, or perhaps Kherson, you mentioned in the beginning of your remarks in southern Ukraine that was occupied in the early days of the war and was liberated this fall, people have complicated feelings. It's not that they have complicated feelings toward their own Ukrainianness, or do they want to be part of Ukraine or Russia? While there are those in eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine, especially who harbor pro Russian sympathies, I think it's fair to talk about them as 10% of the population, and in some cases 5%, less than 5%, a, a small minority that exists but is by no means determinative for the social fabric in these places where you find people who, even if their native language is Russian, even if they have difficulty speaking Ukrainian. They nonetheless feel much more in a civic sense attached to the modern Ukrainian state than wanting to join the Russian one. That said, the experience of this war has been especially traumatic for these cities and towns. They've really been literally on, on the front lines and found themselves under fire multiple times over the course of this war, right? As the Russian army sweeps through, then the Ukrainian army sweeps through, and now the Russian army is on the march again, right? They're the Ukrainian, or the modern Ukrainian version of what the American historian Timothy Snyder calls bloodlands, right? The places that just find themselves constantly stuck between warring armies and bearing the brunt of that violence. So in Kherson, in southern Ukraine, the actual 
violence being meted out on the residents of Kherson has only increased since its liberation because now Russia is actively shelling the center of the city and every day killing people in the streets of Kherson. When Kherson was under Russian occupation, there were other dangers and indignities and other forms of violence being meted out on its population, abductions, torture, killings, and so on. But the city was not being actively shelled. Now that the Ukrainian army has taken back Kherson, Russia has been pushed out of the city. Now, from its positions outside Kherson, it is shelling into Kherson. And so Kherson is a much more difficult place to live than it had been under occupation. And that is just a strange and difficult reality that both the people of Kherson have to face, but also Ukraine writ large as a state has to face. That the story doesn't end with liberation. And in a case like Kherson, it only has gotten more difficult, actually. Here in the United States, we hear a lot of reporting about the enormous number of internally and now externally displaced people, the scale of the destruction. It leads you to assume that even after the fighting stops, in whatever way that happens, Ukraine isn't going to be a country fit to return to for hundreds of thousands of people. There is no place for them to come back to. When you see pictures of these towns, you can't imagine people living in them, going to work in them, going to school in them, you know, switching on a light and having there be electricity, turning a tap and having water come out. They've been pulverized. Yes, I think the road to reconstruction is going to be a long one. And and in the case of some cities in eastern Ukraine of the type that you just mentioned, that may never happen. They, they might have to be essentially rebuilt from scratch or populations relocated, resettled elsewhere. The infrastructure damage to Ukraine has been extraordinary. One of the last stories I reported for The New Yorker was about Russia's campaign aimed specifically at energy infrastructure, sending missiles and drones to attack power plants, substations, the energy grid, which means that Ukrainians far away from the front lines in places like Lviv, Ivano-Frankivsk, deep in Ukraine's west, as far as you can get in Ukraine away from the fighting in the east, people there suffer from regular blackouts. The power goes out. That means the internet goes out. The water goes out. The heating can go out. And that sort of damage is going to be incredibly difficult and complicated to repair. And so the the scars of war are, are not just going to be in those cities that have been effectively really wiped off the face of the earth, I think it's fair to say, in some of the towns in the Donbass that have received the brunt of the Russian onslaught. But places all over Ukraine are already showing the physical scars of war that are going to take a lot of uh, time and, and a lot of money to heal. For now, the West seems quite steadfast in its commitments to Ukraine, military aid, economic aid. But If the war goes on for much longer, will that aid be unlimited? When the war ends, what sort of response will there be? What sort of appetite will there be for long-term reconstruction in the West? All open questions. Do you have any question after all this time and your familiarity with both countries that it's part of Russia's theory of how to prosecute this war that even if they lose, they're making big chunks of Ukraine, unlivable, that it's intentional. I think that is the sad logic of this war, that after Russia realized, really within a matter of days, that it wasn't going to enter Kiev, overthrow the government, install a pro-Russian puppet, and, and rule Ukraine as a satellite, as its initial war aims seem to suggest was the plan. But that plan fell apart within a matter of days, Russian tanks weren't able to enter Kiev. Zelensky remained in power. And very quickly, Russia transitioned to a more familiar for its style of war, which is destruction, essentially. And and raising the pain threshold so high for the adversary, the idea is that at some point the population will simply give up, will beg its political leaders to negotiate. That seems to be Russia's strategy in its destruction of the Donbass. That seems certainly to be Russia's strategy in the strikes on energy and power infrastructure and making life difficult for people across the country that I just 
mentioned. The thing is, it just doesn't seem to be working objectively in Ukraine, right? I don't say this, this isn't because of some sympathy that, that certainly exists too for the Ukrainian people. I'm just looking at the polls, which show no real significant change in the amount of Ukrainians surveyed who say they want total victory against Russia. No negotiations. People who say that victory will only come when Ukrainians take back the occupied peninsula of Crimea, which was annexed by Russia in 2014. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately just given the human toll involved, but as Russia makes this war more and more painful for Ukrainians, that doesn't actually make Ukrainians more inclined to give up or negotiate with Russia. And that's horrific in the sense that the human toll continues to rise and the, and the pain and trauma of this war continues to rise. But it also suggests that Russia's plan isn't working and, and, and will it work, right? Because Russia, too, with when as it mounts one attempt at an offensive after another, begins to exhaust its military resources. It's getting, we're already seeing diminishing returns from Russia's military initiatives in Ukraine. And if it's not actually moving the needle in terms of Ukraine's willingness to fight and resist, and all it's doing is depleting Russia's own resources to continue that fight, while Russia is potentially putting itself in a very vulnerable position for Ukrainian counterattack. So this strategy is a cruel one, but I'm not sure in the context of Ukraine how successful it's going to be. We've talked about how your reporting has leaned more toward the situation of the people of the country rather than trying to count burned tanks or destroyed armored personnel carriers. How do people make sense of what they're going through? When you talk to a woman who's living in a basement, toting her own water from a common spigot because she hasn't had internal plumbing for months and months now. What do people make of what's happening to them? Something I found really jolting and in a way terrifying about this war is how readily people adapt to their circumstances, whatever they may be. I'm not saying that they're happy about them, but I found that time and again in Kiev at the beginning of the war, a city that I had been to many, many times over the course of 10 years, a, a vibrant, lively European capital, great people, great restaurants. And overnight, it was turned into a ghost town under siege with Russian tanks at the gates. And, and, and people adjusted to that horrible and terrifying reality. Same thing in a place like Izum occupied by Russia in the spring, liberated by Ukraine in the fall. People managed to make do, managed to contort their lives to fit with the, 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 the changing circumstances, whether, like you described, you know, a literal scene that happens all over Ukraine of people living in basements trying to escape or stay safe from the shelling above or, or living without water, living without heat, some months ago, these were people absolutely like you or I, right? To, to think that, well, there's something maybe more hardy in the Ukrainian character. Perhaps there is. But these were people who were very well used to the creature comforts of modern life for some time, right? These are not people who were somehow used to deprivation, and so this war came as less of a shock to them. Not at all. These were people who lived you know, modern lives of creature comforts, just like you or I. And those comforts, along with just a baseline sense of safety, was removed overnight. And, and the degree to which people adapt to that is, in some ways, a remarkable testament to the human spirit. But it's also quite disturbing and quite um, difficult to see how quickly that can become people's new normal. You've been listening to Joshua Yaffa of The New Yorker magazine. Joshua, your reporting from Ukraine has been moving. It's been enlightening. It's been harrowing. I want to thank you for making time for us and be careful. Thanks so much. My pleasure to talk. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Elise Manukian and Andrew Stelzer. It was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. 
Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is CEO of World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.